He is supposed to have communicated his plans to her and to have been aided by her in obtaining recruits and money among her people. At any rate, he always spoke of her with the greatest respect and declared that General Tubman, as he styled her, was a better officer than most whom he had seen and could command an army as successfully as she led her small parties of fugitives. Her own veneration for Captain Brown has always been profound and since his murder has taken the form of a religion. She had often risked her own life for her people and she thought nothing of that, but that a white man and a man so noble and strong should so take upon himself the burden of a despised race she could not understand, and she took refuge from her perplexity in the mysteries of her favorite religion. Again, she laid great stress on a dream, which she had just before she met Captain Brown in Canada. She thought she was in a wilderness sort of place, all full of rocks and bushes, when she saw a serpent raise its head among the rocks, and as it did so, it became the head of an old man with a long white beard, glazing at her wistful-like, just as if he were going to speak to me. And then two other heads rose up beside him, younger than he. And as she stood looking at them and wondering what they could want with her, a great crowd of men rushed in and struck down the younger heads, and then the head of the old man, still looking at her so wistful. This dream she had again and again and could not interpret it. But when she met Captain Brown, shortly after, behold, he was the very image of the head she had seen. But still she could not make out what her dream signified, till the news came to her of the tragedy of Harper Ferry, and then she knew the two other heads were his two sons. She was in New York at the time, and on the day of the affair at Harper's Ferry, she felt her usual warning that something was wrong but could not tell what. Finally, she told her hostess that it must be Captain Brown who was in trouble, and that they should soon hear bad news from him. The next day's newspaper brought tidings of what had happened. Her last visit to Maryland was made after this in December 1860, and in spite of the agitated condition of the country and the greater watchfulness of the slaveholders, she brought away seven fugitives, one of them an infant, which must be drugged with opium to keep it from crying on the way, and so revealing the hiding place of the party. She brought these safely to New York, but there was a new difficulty met her. It was the mad winter of compromises, when state after state and politician after politician went down on their knees to beg the South not to secede. The hunting of fugitive slaves began again. Mr. Stewart went over to the side of compromise. He knew the history of this poor woman. He had given his enemies a hold on him by dealing with her. It was thought he could not scruple to betray her. The suspicion was an unworthy one, for though the secretary could betray a cause, he could not surely have put her enemies on the track of a woman who was thus in his power after such a career as hers had been. But so little confidence was then felt in Mr. Stewart by men who had voted for him and with him that they hurried Harriet off to Canada sorely against her will. She did not long remain there. The war broke out for which she had been looking, and she hastened to her New York friends to prepare for another expedition to Maryland to bring away the last of her family. Before she could start, however, the news came of the capture of Port Royal. Instantly she conceived the idea of going there and working among her people on the islands and the mainland. Money was given her, a pass was secured through the agency of Governor Andrew, and she went to Buford. There she has made herself useful in many ways, has been employed as a spy by General Hunter, and finally was piloted is part of Colonel Montgomery on his most successful expedition. We gave some notice of this fact last week. Since then, we have received the following letter, dictated by her, from which it appears that she needs some contributions for her work. We trust she will receive them, for none has better deserved it. 
She asks nothing for herself except that her wardrobe may be replenished, and even this she will probably share with the first needy person she meets. Beaufort, South Carolina, June 30th, 1863. Last fall, when the people here became very much alarmed for fear of an invasion from the rebels, all my clothes were packed and sent with others to Hilton Head and lost. I have never been able to get any trace of them since. I was sick at the time and unable to look after them myself. I want among the rest a bloomer dress, some made of coarse strong material to wear on expeditions. In our late expedition up the uh, Comahee River, in coming on board the boat, I was carrying two pigs for a poor sick woman who had a child to carry and the order double quick was given and I started to run stepped in my dress, it being rather long, and fell and tore it almost off, so that when I got on but would have a bloomer as soon as I could get it. So please make this known to the ladies, if you will, for I expect to have use for it very soon, probably before they can get it to me. You have, without doubt, seen a full account of the expedition I refer to. Don't you think we colored people are entitled to some credit for that export under the head of the brave Colonel Montgomery? We weakened the rebels somewhat on the Comahee River by taking and bringing away 756 head of their most valuable livestock, known up in your region as contrabands. And this, too, without the loss of a single life on our part, though we had good reason to believe that a number of rebels bit the dust. Of the 756 contrabands, nearly or quite all the able men have joined the color regiments here. I have now been absent two years almost, and have just got letters from my friends in Auburn urging me to come home. My father and mother are old and in feeble health and need my care and attention. I hope the good people there among other duties which I have is that of looking after the hospital here for contrabands. Most of those coming from the mainland are very destitute, almost naked. I am trying to find places for the, those able to work and provide for them as best I can so as to lighten the burden on the government as much as possible, while at the same time they learn to respect themselves by earning their own living. Remember me very kindly to Mrs. and her daughters, also, if you will, to my Boston friends, Mrs. C., Miss H., and especially to Mr. and Mrs. George L. Stearns, to whom I am under great obligation for their many kindnesses. I shall be sure to come and see you all if I live to go north. If you write, direct your letter to the care of C. In the spring of 1860, Harriet Tubman was requested by Mr. Garriott Smith to go to Boston to attend a large anti-slavery meeting. On her way, she stopped at Troy to visit a cousin. While there, the colored people were one day startled with the intelligence that a fugitive slave by the name of Charles uh, N.A.L.L.E. had been followed by his master, who was a younger brother and not one grain whiter than he, and that he was already in the hands of the officers and was to be taken back to the South. The instant Harriet heard the news, she started for the office of the U.S. Commissioner, scattering the tidings as she went. An excited crowd were, was, were gathered about the office, through which Harriet forced her way and rushed upstairs to the door of the room where the fugitive was detained. A wagon was already waiting before, before the door to carry off the man, but the crowd was even then so great and in such a state of excitement that the officers did not dare to bring the man down. On the opposite side of the street stood the colored people, watching the window where they could see Harriet's sunbonnet and feeling assured that so long as she stood there, the fugitive was still in the office. Time passed on, he did not appear. They've taken him out another way, and depend upon that said some of the colored people. No, replied others, there stands Moses yet, and as long as she is there, he is safe. Harriet, now seeing the necessity for a tremendous effort for his rescue, sent out some little boys to cry fire. The bells rang. The crowd increased till the whole street 
was a dense mass of people. Again and again, the officers came out to try and clear the stairs and make a way to take their captive down. Others were driven down, but Harriet stood her ground. Her head bent down and her arms folded. Come, old woman, you must get out of this, said one of the officers. I must have the way cleared. If you can't get down alone, someone will help you. Harriet, still putting on a greater appearance of discrepancy, twitched away from him and kept her place. Officers were made to buy Charles from his master, who at first agreed to take $1,200 for him. But when that was subscribed, he immediately raised the price to 1500 The crowd grew more excited. A gentleman raised the window and called out $200 for his rescue, but not one cent to his master. This was responded to by a roar of satisfaction. They open a lane to the wagon. They would promise to bring the man down the front way. The lane was open and the man was brought out, a tall, handsome, intelligent white man with his wrists mangled together, walking between the U.S. Marshal and another officer. Behind him, his brother and his master, so like him that one could hardly be told from the other. The moment they appeared, Harriet roused from her stooping posture, threw open a window and cried to her friends, Here he comes, take him, and then darted down the stairs like a wild cat. She seized one officer, pulled him down, then another, and tore him away from the man. Keeping her arms above the slave, she cried to her friends, Drag us out, drag him to the river, drown him, don't let them have him. They were knocked down together, and while down, she tore off her sunbonnet and tied it on the head of the fugitive. When he rose, only his head could be seen, and amongst the surging past of the people, the slave was no longer recognized, while the master appeared like the slave. Again and again they were knocked down, the poor slave utterly helpless, with his mangled wrists streaming with blood. Harriet's outer clothes were, were torn from her, and even her stout shoes were all pulled from her feet, yet she never relinquished her hold of the man, till she, was, she had dragged him to the river, where he was tumbled into a boat, Harriet following in a ferry boat on the other side. But the telegraph was ahead of him, as soon as they landed, he was seized and hurried from her sight. After a time, some school children came hurrying along into her anxious inquiries. They answered, He is up in that house in the third story. Harriet rushed to the place. Some men were attempting to make their way up the stairs. The officers were firing down, and two men were lying on the stairs who had been shot. Over other bodies, our heroine rushed, and with the help of others, burst open the door of the room, dragged out the fugitive, whom Harriet carried downstairs in her arms. A gentleman who was riding by with a fine horse stopped to ask what the disturbance meant, and on hearing the story, his sympathies seemed to be thoroughly aroused. He sprang from his wagon, calling out, That is a blood horse. Drive him till he drops. The poor man was hurried in. Some of his friends jumped in after him and drove at the most rapid speed to S-C-H-E-N-E-C-T-A-D-Y. This is the story Harriet told to the writer. By some persons it seemed too wonderful for belief, and an attempt was made to collaborate it. Reverend Henry Fowler, who was at the time at Saratoga, kindly volunteered to go to Troy and assert the facts. His report was that he had had a long interview with Mr. Townsend, who acted during the trial as counsel for the slave, that he had given him a rich narration, which he would write out the next week for this little book. But before he was uh, to begin his generous labor, and while engaged in some kind efforts for the prisoners at Arborn, he was stricken down by the heat of the sun, and it was a long time debarred from labor. Fugitive Slave Rescue in Troy From the Troy Whig, April 28, 1859 Yesterday afternoon, the streets in, of this city in West Troy were made the scenes of unexampled excitement. For the first time since the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law, an attempt was made here to carry its provisions into execution, and the result was a terrific encounter between the officers and the prisoners' friends, the triumph of mob law, and the final rescue of the fugitive. Our city was thrown into a grand state of turmoil, and for a time every other topic was forgotten to give place to this new excitement. People did not think last evening to ask who was nominated at Charleston or whether the news of the 
Henan's and Sayer's battle had arrived. Everything was merged into the fugitive slave case, of which it seemed the end is not yet. Charles N-A-L-L-E, the fugitive who was the cause of this excitement, was a slave on the plantation of B.W. Hansborough. It's H-A-N-S-B-O-R-O-U-G-H in Culpeper County, Virginia, till the 19th of October, 1858, when he made his escape and went to live in Columbia, Pennsylvania. A wife and five children are residing there now. Not long since he came to Sand Lake in this county and resided in the family of Mr. Crosby until about three weeks ago. Since that time, he has been employed as coachman by Yuri Gilbert Esquire of this, this city. He's about 30 years of age, tall, quite light, complected, and good looking. He is said to have been an excellent and faithful servant. At Sand Lake, we understand that Nady was often seen by one H. F. Avail, A. V. E. R. I. L. L., formerly connected with one of the papers of the city who communicated with his reputed owner in Virginia and gave the information that led to a knowledge of the whereabouts of the fugitive. Everell wrote letters for him and thus obtained acquaintance with his history. Mr. Hansborough sent on an agent, Henry J. Wall, by whom the necessary papers were got out to arrest the fugitive. Yesterday morning, about 11 o'clock, Charles Nelly was sent to procure some bread for the family by whom he was employed. He failed to return. At the Baker's, he was arrested by Deputy United States Marshal J.W. Holmes and immediately taken before the United States Commissioner Miles Bre Breach. The son of Mr. Gilbert, thinking it strange that he did not come back, sent to the house of William Henry on Division Street where he boarded and his whereabouts was discovered. The examination before Commissioner Beach was quite brief. The evidence of Averell and the agent was taken, and the commissioner decided to remain in uh, Navelle to Virginia. The necessary papers were made out and given to the marshal. By this time it was two o'clock, and the fact became, began to be noised abroad that there was a fugitive slave in Mr. Beach's office, Corner State and First Street. People in knots of ten or twelve collected near the entrance looking at Nelly, who could be seen in an upper window. William Henry, a colored man, with whom Nellie boarded, commenced talking from the curb stone in a loud voice to the crowd. He uttered some sentences as, There is a fugitive slave in that office. Pretty soon you will see him come forth. He is going to be taken down south, and you will have a chance to see him. He is to be taken to the depot to go to Virginia in the first train. Keep watch of those stairs, and you will have a sight. A number of women kept shouting, crying, and by loud appeals, excited that colored persons assembled. Still the crowd grew in numbers. Wagons halted in front of the locality and were soon piled with spectators. An alarm of fire was sounded and hose carriages dashed through the ranks of men, women, and boys. But they closed again and kept looking with expectant eyes at the window where the negro was visible. Meanwhile, angry discussions commenced. Some persons agitated a rescue. Others favored law and order. Mr. Brockway, a lawyer, had his coat torn for expressing his sentiments and other melees kept the interest alive. All at once there was a wild hula, and every eye was turned up to see the legs and part of the body of the prisoner protruding from the second story window, at which he was endeavoring to escape. Then arose a shout, drop him, catch him, hooray. But the attempt was a fruitless one, for somebody in the office pulled Nellie back again amidst the shouts of a hundred pairs of lungs. The crowd at that time numbered nearly a thousand persons many of whom were black and a good share were of the female sex. They blocked up State Street from First Street to the alley and kept surging to and fro. Martin uh, I. Townsend, Esquire, who acted as counsel for the fugitive, did not arrive in the commissioner's office until a decision had been rendered. He immediately went before Judge Could G-O-U-L-D, of the Supreme Court and procured a writ of habeas corpus in the usual form returnable immediately. This was given Deputy Sheriff Nathaniel Upham, who at once proceeded to Commissioner Beach's office and served it on Holmes. Very injusticiously, the officers proceeded at once to Judge uh, Goods 
G U L D apostrophe S office. Although it was evident they would have to pass through an excited and reasonable crowd, as soon as the officers and their prisoner emerged from the door, an old Negro who had been standing at the bottom of the stairs shouted, Here they come! And the crowd made a terrible rush at the party. From the office of Commissioner Beach in the mutual building to that of Judge Good, G U G O U L D, in Congress Street, in less than two blocks, it was made a regular battlefield. The moment the prisoner emerged from the doorway in custody of Deputy Sheriff Upham, Chief of Police Quinn, Officers Cleveland and Holmes, the crowd made one grand surge, and those nearest the prisoner seized him violently with the intent of pulling him away from the officers, but they were foiled and down first to Congress Street and up the ladder in front of Judge Goyd's chambers went the surging mass. Excitedly what it did Go on in the crowd, it is impossible to say. But the pulling, hauling, mauling, and shouting gave evidence of frantic efforts on the part of the rescuers and a stern resistance from the conservators of the law. In front of Judges Good's office, the combat was at its height. No stones or other missiles were used. The battle was fist to fist. We believe an order was given to take the prisoner the other way, and there was a grand rush towards the west past First and River Streets as far as Dock Street. All this time, there was a continual melee. Many of the officers were hurt, among them Mr. Upham, whose object was solely to do his duty by taking Nelly before Judge Gold's, in accordance with, with the right of habeas corpus. A number of the crowd were more or less hurt, and it is any wonder that these were not badly injured, as pistols were drawn and chisels used. The battle had raged as far as the corner of Dock and Congress Streets, and the victory remained with the rescuers at last. The officers were completely worn out from their exertions, and it was impossible to continue their hold upon him any longer. Now he was at liberty. His friends rushed him down Dock Street to the lower ferry, where there was a stick, a cursed line ready to start. The fugitive was put in, and the Roman rode off, and amongst the shouts of hundreds who lined the banks of the river, Nelly was carried into Albany County. As the Skirks landed in West Troy, a Negro sympathizer waded up to his waist and pulled Nelly out of the boat. He went up the hill alone, however, and there who could be he meet but Constable Becker. The latter official, seeing a man with manacles on, considered his duty to arrest him. He did so, and took him in a wagon to the office of Justice Stewart on the second floor of the corner building in the ferry. The justice was absent. When the crowd on the Troy Bank had seen Nelly safely landed, it was suggested he might be recaptured. Then there was another rush made for the ferry, steam ferry boat, which carried over about 400 people and left as many more, a few of the latter being soused in their effort to get on the boat. On landing in West Troy there, sure enough, was the prisoner locked up in a strong office protected by Officer Becker, Brown, and Morrison, and the door barricaded. Not a moment was lost. Upstairs went a score or more of result men, the rest piling in, promiscuously shouting and extricating the officers. Soon a stone flew against the door, then another, and bang, bang, went off a couple of pistols. But the officers who fired them took great care to aim pretty high. The assailants were forced to retreat for a moment. They've got pistols, said one. Who cares, was the reply. They can only kill a dozen of us. Come on. More stones and more pistol shots ensued. At last the door was pulled open by an immense negro, and in a moment he was felled by a hatchet in the hands of Deputy Sheriff Morrison. But the body of the fallen man blocked up the door so that it could not be shut, and a friend of the prisoner pulled him out. Poor fellow, he might well say, save me from my friends. Amidst the pulling and hauling, the iron had cut his arms, which were bleeding profusely, and he could walk, hardly walk owing to fatigue. He has since arrived safely in Canada. Statements made by Martin I. Townsend, Esquire of Troy, who was counsel for the fugitive Charles Neely. Neely is an octoroon. His wife was the same infusion of Caucasian blood. She was the daughter of her master and had with her sister been bred by him in his family as his own child. When the father died, both of these daughters were married and had large families of children. Under the highly Christian national laws of old Virginia, 
These children were the slaves of their grandfather. The old man died even a well, whereby he manually minted his daughters and their children and provided for their purchase of the freedom of their husbands. The manumission of the children and grandchildren took effect, but the estate was insufficient to purchase the husbands of their daughters and the father of his grandchildren. The manumit by another Christian conservative and national provision of law were forced to leave the state while the slave husbands remained in slavery. Nelly and his brother-in-law were allowed for a while to visit their families outside Virginia about once a year, but were at length ordered to provide themselves with new wives as they would be allowed to visit their former ones no more. It was after this that Nelly and his brother-in-law started for the land of freedom, guided by the steady light of the North, North Star. Thank God, neither family now need fear any earthly master or the bay of bloodhound dogging their fugitive steps. Nelly returned to Troy with his family about July 1860 and resided with them there for more than seven years. They are all now residents of the city of Washington, D.C. Nelly and his family are persons of refined manners and of the highest respectability. Several of his children are red-headed and a stranger would discover no trace of African blood in their complexion or features. It was the head of this family whom H. F. Averill, A. V. E. R. I. L. L., proposed to doom to returnless exile and lifelong slavery. When Nael was brought from Commissioner Beach's office into the street, Harriet Truman, who had been standing with the excited crowd, rushed among the foremost to Nelly and running one of her arms round his mackled arm, held on to him without ever losing her hold through the more than half-hour struggle to, to Judge uh, Gord's office and from Judge Gord's office to the dock, where Nellie's liberation was accomplished. In the middle, she was repeatedly beaten over the head with policemen's clubs, but she, but she never for a moment released her hold, but cheered Nellie and her friends with her voice and struggled with the officers until... They were liberally worn out with their exertions, and Nellie was separated from them. True, she had strong and earnest helpers in her struggles, some of whom had white faces as well as human hearts and are now in heaven. But she exposed herself to the fury of sympathizers with slavery without fear and suffered their blows without flinching. Harry crossed the river with the crowd in the ferry boat, and when the men who led the assault upon the door of Judge Stewart's office were stricken down, Harriet and a number of other colored women rushed over their bodies, brought Nellie out, and putting him in the first wagon passing, started him for the west. A livery team driven by a colored man was immediately sent on to relieve the other, and Nellie was seen about Troy no more until he returned a free man by purchase from his master. Harriet also disappeared and the crowd dispersed. How she came to be in Troy that day is entirely unknown to our citizens, and where she hid herself after the rescue is equally a mystery. But her struggle was in the sight of a thousand, perhaps of five thousand spectators. This woman of whom you have been reading is poor and partially disabled from her injuries, yet she supports her cheerfully and uncomplainingly herself and her old parents, and always has several poor children in her home who are dependent entirely upon her exertions. At present, she has three of these children for whom she is providing while her parents are working to pay b back money borrowed to bring them on. She also maintains her exertions among the good people of Elburn, two schools of free men in the South, providing them teachers and sending them clothes and books. She never asks for anything for herself, but she does ask the charity of the public for her people. For them, her tears will fall. For them, her prayers ascend. To them, her toils and cares be given till toils and cares will end. If any persons are disposed to aid her in her benevolent efforts, they may send donations to Rev. S. M. Hopkins, professor of Elborn Theological Seminary, who will make such disposition of the funds sent as may be designated by the donors. End of the book, Scenes in the Life of Harriet Tubman. Next will be added the appendix, and been read by Peter John Parisis.